Harry Met Virtual Traveller, hello and welcome to Stories from Law, a monthly podcast that explores folklore and the stories it inspires. My name is Dawn Nelson and I am an author and professional storyteller. This month, patrons chose the theme of Sirens of the Lakes, and so, as is often is the case with folklore, there are some dark folkloric characters explored in this podcast. And so, as always, I would recommend that you should listen through first before listening with younger members of your household. In my research for this episode, I discovered a plethora of beings that inhabit the lakes and locks of Europe. The Tizzy Wizzy of the Lake District, which is a strange little hybrid being that is said to live on the shores of Lake Windermere. It has the body of a hedgehog, and the tail of a swirl, and the wings of an insect. In the early 1900s, a fisherman led tourists on a Tizzy Wizzy hunt. It's most peculiar. There are the bell-stealing river mermaids of Hertfordshire, and the incredibly famous Loch Ness Monster. There's also a terrifying Irish joint eater, I discovered, which are actually troublesome fairies that disguise themselves as newts. And if you happen to fall asleep beside a river, they will crawl down your throat and steal your food so that you wither away and die. Quite terrifying, frankly. And just as a friend to newts, I'd like to assure you that newts do not do that. That is definitely folklore. I can't possibly hope to fit all of this lake folklore into one episode. That would be epic. And so I've decided to focus on two themes which crop up again and again, lake wives and water horses. I will explore lake wives in the Podbean episode of the podcast. And the story from Law will be one of my original tales, which looks at the origin of Jenny Greenteeth. I will then go on to explore water horses in the extended version, which is available on my Patreon. And the second story from law for that would be the Laird of Morphy. So let's get started with lake wives. I'm going to start with the lake wives of Europe and then I'm going to make my way back across the UK for our story from law. Let's start in Scandinavia with the Sjöres. Sjöres can be found in the lakes and mountain pools of Scandinavia. Her territory will be a group of interconnected lakes and pools and she will rule over the animals, fish and the fishermen in those places. It is advisable to leave the Sjöra offerings of coins or tobacco in order to ensure safe passage when fishing, for she can warn you of bad weather and ensure you take home a good catch. Unlike her sisters, the Nex, Nox or Nixies, She will not drown you just to be cruel, but beware, for she is a vengeful being, so do ensure you do not cross her. She is sometimes seen with a herd of cows, but these cows soon disappear if any human lays eyes on them. This is reminiscent of the legend of Welsh fairy cows, which I'm telling as my illuminated tale this month across on the Patreon. It tells of the origin of the Welsh black cattle, which are thought to be descendants of lake cows, fairy cows from Unwin or the other world as it's known. And lakes are the door to this other world of Anwen, which is a recurring theme in Celtic mythology. So again, you see the parallels between Scandinavian and Celtic mythology there. I mentioned the Neck or Nacken of Scandinavia just now, and these are like the counterparts of Sjöras. They are male, not female, and they are unnecessarily cruel. They are expert musicians which will lure you to your death with their enchanting music, But the neck can teach you to play this music. But the price for that is very high. But let us continue with Women of the Lakes and take a look at the Rusalka from Slavic folklore. She is definitely a malicious being, as are most of these lake wives, to be honest. But she wasn't always that way. It's thought that she was originally a pagan goddess of fertility for the Slavic peoples and that she ensured the crops were watered well and were bountiful. In the 19th century, however, they morphed into unquiet spirits. They were the ghosts of those who died of unnatural causes or even suicide. Yes, that old chestnut. The Rusalka is a siren, a beautiful being that will lure men to their death in the river, drown them and in some cases tickle them to death. During Green Week, a fertility festival celebrated in early June as part of the Slavic traditions, It is thought that you should not swim in the rivers, for this is when the Rusalka are most prevalent. 
In Lithuanian folklore, the Lauma is a primordial goddess, a shape-shifting woman who originated from the sky and is thought to have actually been the wife of a thunder god. As a result of a spell of infidelity, the Lauma now lives in lakes rather than the sky, and it seems sometimes the Lauma are actually plural, or other times just a single entity. Many similarities can be drawn between these beings and the lake wives of Europe, though. Like the Suras, they are said to have a herd of cows, only these cows are quite amenable and can be milked by anyone brave enough to do so. Like the Rasulkas, the Lauma will also lure men to their death and are also fond of using tickling as a weapon of choice. In Catalan, the Alaujas are female water spirits that can transform into blackbirds. These too are fertility spirits and they can live for thousands of years and possess eternal youth. They're not malevolent at all, which is a nice change, and will in fact bring you good fortune. You can marry an Aloha, with her consent of course, but you must never reveal that she is a water spirit, or she will disappear and take your fortune with her. From blackbirds to swans, and let's take a look at the swan maidens of Germany. These are typically women who hang around beside lakes and rivers and can shapeshift into swans. Swan maidens are a little like selkies in many respects, for if you manage to take possession of their feathered coat, once they've shed it, then, well, she cannot fly away and is forced to become the servant or wife of whomever has her skin. This is the fate of the shape-shifting swan woman who appears in Hans Christian Andersen's The Marsh King's Daughter. It tells of an Egyptian swan princess captured by the mossy marsh king, where she then gives birth to a cursed daughter who is a meek frog by night and a heathen beauty during the day. The daughter is taken by a stork to a Viking woman who cannot have children and here she is brought up and the story plays out. It's an interesting story but there are plenty of problematic motifs with it and it is of its time. The good ugly woman and the beautiful sinful one are very apparent in this story. The Christian priest who tries to save the wild heathen Viking woman. The kidnapped woman who then gives birth to her captor's child with no mention of the morality of this. It's a curious story, but as I've always maintained, I think it's important to examine the messages in these stories so that we can start retelling them with more positive messages in them and learn from them. We can't talk about Sirens of the Lakes without talking about THE Lady of the Lake. Yep, the lady from Arthurian legend. No one knows when the Arthurian legends date from. They are as old as time. But the first versions of the legends were written in the 11th century and the Lady of the Lake, sometimes called Vivane, appears in several of the legends. It is said that she raised Sir Lancelot, prolonged Arthur's life and is a powerful magical force in the legends. One of the most famous stories is her gift of the sword Excalibur to Arthur. In some stories, it is a stone that Arthur draws the sword from and he and he alone is able to do this. But just like Thor's hammer, there are in fact two origin stories. The Lady of the Lake version of this legend comes from the works of Thomas Mallory. In this story, Merlin takes Arthur to pay his respects to Vervain, who then gives him the sword in return for a favour that she will call on him for later. In time, Vervain does find Arthur and ask for that favour. She asks him to kill her enemy, Balin, who killed her brother. Uh, but Balin is in fact a knight of Arthur's court, and Arthur is fond of him. So Arthur, of course, cannot do this, and instead Balin kills Vivain, and is consequently banished from the court by Arthur. A messy and complicated tale, but you would not expect anything less from the Arthurian legends. The final lake wife of legends I'd like to talk about is Jenny, or Ginny Greenteeth. She is a legendary being of murky ponds, pools and lakes scattered around the countryside of Lancashire in the main, although she can be found in other parts of England under the name of the Grindylow. It is thought that children are told the tales of Jenny Greenteeth in order to deter them from going near the water. For in the summer, when the top of these ponds and lakes is covered with a thick mat of pondweed, it can look like you can stand on them, and so children have been known to do this and, of course, drown in the pond trapped underneath the duckweed. 
So it is sometimes thought that her name simply refers to Lemna Minor or the lesser duckweed, as, like I say, this covers the pools of the northwest where Jenny predominantly hails from. And so as time wore on, the name was used to refer to duckweed rather than the folkloric character of Jenny Greenteeth. So who is Jenny? Well, Jenny Greenteeth is quite simply the stuff of nightmares, a sickly, bony-looking being with long, spindly fingers, ending in what look more like claws than fingernails. Gruesome, yellowing, sharp teeth, all canine and certainly not human. Duckweed hair hanging in a knotted, straggly mass about her face and shoulders, and as she appears, you can hear her hissing and muttering, whispering and cackling. She is, of course, associated with the colour green, and in my research, I discovered that wearing the colour green is associated with a loss of maidenhood, again suggesting Jenny's sinful nature, for want of a better phrase. It's considered a very unlucky colour in some cases, and there is a folk ballad which refers to a lady dressed in green, a murderous woman who tragically kills her own child. This song can be traced back to Denmark, again linking British folklore with that of Scandinavia, but I think it's fascinating the way all these bits of folklore seem to intertwine from beside the pond to playground games, and the woman in green in all of them is not a pleasant character. In the North East, she is known as Peg Powler, or sometimes Nanny Powler. Sometimes they're the same person, sometimes they are actually related to each other. One is the daughter of the other. They are again a hideous hag and inhabit the River Tees and its tributaries. She also, therefore, pops up in Yorkshire. However you know her, if she catches you, she will pull you to the bottom of the water beneath the murky, voluminous algae and you will never return. There are very few actual stories of Jenny Greenteeth other than the anecdotal folklore of don't go near the pond, she'll eat you. So the story I'd like to tell you next is my story of how she came to be. Come with me through the sun-filled meadows, past the susurrating chestnut trees, nodding bluebells and dainty daisies. Follow me to an oasis beneath the ancient willow, where the dragonflies dance and the kingfisher holds its patient vigil. That bird remembers that day, and if you tarry a while, he will tell you of this tale. He will tell you of Jenny Greenteeth and how she came to be. Once upon a time there was a young girl who came each day to sit in the willow tree that grew beside the kingfisher's pond. She would sing the folk songs her mother had taught her, and if she sat high enough in the tree, she could just about see her father in the fields. Lying on the sturdiest of branches, her feet would swing above the crystal blue water, and the willow tree bore it well, for Jenny was young and a small girl for her age. Wrapped in her ancient cradle, Jenny would spend many a happy hour there, Sometimes she would strip down to her bloomers and swim in the cool, deep water of the Meadowland Pond, but her mother and father would warn her against this pastime. One day you will fall in, Jenny, and we will not see you. But you can see me from the field, Papa, Jenny would reply. That I can, but I may not be able to reach you in time, for Jenny Greenteeth is quick and hungry. Jenny would laugh off these gruesome tales, Tell her father and mother not to worry, that she was no match for her namesake, and no Jenny Greenteeth would pull her under the water. Besides, she could swim. The summer wore on, and the pond began to grow algae in a thin film across the top of its mirrored surface. But life continued in the pond. The frogs spawned and the tadpoles became more frogs if they could avoid the hungry newts and dragonfly larvae. The fish in the pond feasted on the green bounty, but Jenny Jenny was sad. She could no longer swim in the pond without getting covered in algae, and her friend the kingfisher could no longer fish with ease. The days he sat on the willow branch became more frequent, and he and Jenny shared many a song. Ducks came to eat the plentiful goodness, but soon even they preferred ponds with a little less of it. It had been a long, hot summer. Good for the harvest, but not for the pond. 
The longest day of the year arrived, Jenny's favourite. She could stay out late and watch the life in the pond below the tree. But the pond had grown tired and knotted with weed, and she was no longer able to gaze into it as she had been. She felt bad for the kingfisher, who could no longer fish, too. Clambering down from the tree, she took a fallen branch and began to clear a gap in the pondweed. The kingfisher looked on eagerly to see if any fish may appear. As she cleared the murky green away, she looked into the pond and the reflection of her face filled the space she had cleared. The pondweed swirled about it like straggly green hair and the reflection smiled back at her. But there was something wrong. She leant closer towards the pond, moving the stick around in front of her, creating fractals in the water that sparkled in the afternoon sun. She tried to get a closer look at the girl in the water. Was it? Could it be? Is it her reflection? The kingfisher whistled a warning as Jenny felt the branch pull away from her. The pondweed twisted upwards along the branch until it covered her hand. Jenny was transfixed, but finally the cold, wet weed on her hand brought her to reality. She struggled to free her arm, but the weed continued to loop and curl its way towards her until she felt her feet slipping on the grassy bank, and as she edged further and further towards the pond, finally the icy cold water lapped against her ankles. She pulled this way and that, all the time the kingfisher whistling from the willow tree. She shouted for her father, but he was head down in the fields and too far to hear. The water crept further and further up her body until she felt what she could only describe as a hand on her head, pushing her down into the water. Jenny never went home that day. And they never found her body in the pond. Now Jenny is the stuff of legends. Many have said that in the gloaming hour, if you visit the pond beneath the willow in the meadow, there is a girl with duckweed hair and sickly green skin that sits beside the water's edge and sings with the kingfisher. She is the real Jenny Greenteeth. I hope you enjoyed that story. Thank you as always to my patrons for their continued support of my storytelling and the podcast. As previously mentioned, in the extended version of this episode, available via my Patreon, I will continue to look at the folklore of lakes with water horses. And the second story that I'm telling for patrons for this episode is The Laird of Morphe. My patron is called Rewild Yourself Through Story and is focused on using story to reconnect with the land we live on and the nature within it. You can become a patron to benefit from a range of rewards, digital zines, ways to connect with nature through story, audio stories, extended versions of this podcast and online workshops are all available as rewards. There are of course other ways to support the podcast and you can do this by sharing the podcast with your friends and leaving me a review as this helps these stories to travel to new audiences and find new souls to warm. If you wish to hear more stories woven with folklore in the old ways, you can of course find me on Instagram as DD underscore storyteller, on Facebook as DD storyteller, and via my Facebook group Stories from Law. I hope to see you there, as I'd love to tell you another story. Until then, toodle pip. <laughs>